So as they say in the, in the, you know, in the Eastern Orthodox liturgy, the doors, the doors. That's right. Only, only the elect may proceed at this point. All right. Let us, uh, let's go ahead and begin with prayer. And this is a thanksgiving from the Book of Common Prayer. Heavenly Father, you sent your own Son into this world. We thank you for the life of children entrusted to our care. Help us to remember that we are all your children, and so to love and nurture them, that they may attain to that full stature intended for them in your eternal kingdom for the sake of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right, well, thank you for coming tonight. And as I said, the title is uh, The Beauty, or The Beginning and Dignity of Human Life. And so I wanted to start just with a nod to our present political moment, right? Because this, this is happening in a context, right? And so this was a CBS poll that I saw kind of on the Twitterverse that went around. And so, you know, you figure, I thought, okay, CBS, has, you know, a CBS poll is probably kind of midline, um, you know, in terms of, but it's interesting, basically the question, as you can see, is so poorly framed just from, basically the question is, you know, should abortion, so basically they got you on the phone. Should abortion, please choose one of the above. There are four choices. Should abortion be legal in all cases? Should abortion be legal in most cases? Should, illegal, should abortion be illegal in most cases? Or should abortion be illegal in all circumstances? And that's the question that gets asked to people. And so you can see how even there is framed in order to highlight polarization. You know, in order to really try to get people to, to, to pull apart. And so from the get-go, what I wanted to highlight is that, in a sense, the, one of the, the, the chief problem of that for our purposes tonight, for my purpose anyway, is that the problem is right here. Right? So you can see how the question is framed. And the realm... Uh, of human activity or endeavor in which this the the bias of the survey is that this that this is it suggests already where this question should be adjudicated where the sources of authority are how this should get decided it's already in the question it's baked in right and it's already pulling people's heads in that direction so I will not be addressing from you know until the very end legality or illegality but I want to start out by saying that there is much in our lives, in our culture, that is immoral, that is a sin, that is contrary to the word of God and his will for human persons that is, that are, is perfectly legal. I mean, would, in a sense, to get your agreement that, there's, that, that there are a lot of things that are morally wrong that are perfectly legal. Let's give some examples. Pornography, right off the bat, let's pornography. I don't care what the Supreme Court says if they can rec recognize it when they see it. It's wrong, it's a sin, it's contrary to the will of God for people to participate in that industry, in that uh, activity. So there's one thing, for example, I see, I view as immoral, perfectly legal, protected by the courts and their interpretation of the Constitution. AR-15s, I'll just say it, I'll come out and say it. I don't believe someone who's outside law enforcement or the armed forces should have one. I don't think they ought to. I, it's, you know, hunting rifles, sure. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the Boy Scout program. We do rifle safety. We do the, sh I've, you know, done the shotgun and rifle merit badge with all three of my boys. I mean, you know, we train boys. All the instructors for those merit badges, NRA instructors, you know, they're all there. I mean, that's the, the preeminent, you know, certification body is the NRA. They provide safety training for all these youth. You know, shot 22s, shot, you know, you know, you know 3 out of 6s, all that kind of stuff. The R15s, I don't believe, are immoral for a regular person to have. Perfectly legal. Perfectly legal. Oligarchic wealth. Oligarchic wealth. 
let's just assume that Jeff Bezos didn't cheat, rob, or steal from anybody to get those billions of dollars. Let's just assume that. But in my view, as a Christian, that kind of wealth is immoral for one person to have a control. I mean, I'm just like people who have oligarchic society influencing levels of wealth. One person, all those resources, I believe is immoral, contrary to the will of God. At least as I read the scriptures and the tradition. Perfectly legal. <laughs> Absolutely legal. All right. So from the get go, I want to try to get your heads pulled out of this which I've run, I run into time and time again, particularly with Episcopalians, that basically legal and moral are the same thing because of the socioeconomic cultural world in which we live. But what I'm saying is they're not the same thing. They're two different categories of evaluation of an action, whether it's legal or illegal, whether it's moral, immoral. There are, by the way, things that are absolutely moral that are illegal. Trespassing in the course of civil disobedience. Illegal for people to be in that place. They are arrested under the laws. If they are protesting something that is an injustice, in my view, that is a, an example of someone doing something that is moral and a good, but which is illegal, for which those who are seeking the good would be willing to take the consequences of that illegal act in order to show up the injustice of whatever they're protesting. Right? So that would be an example of something that's where it's the other way around. So I'm just trying to get your heads out of our kind of our, our training because we're trained as good, basically from our backgrounds, <laughs> from as good kids, to think that the rules are moral and enshrine a morality. Now, there may be overlap. There may be overlap. But one thing that both, that strikes me, that both reform movements and revanchist movements, that is, kind of movements that seek to go to a more kind of, uh, you know, kind of ar ar repristinated, archaic past of some sort of golden age of morality, so that sort of revanchism, seek to draw, in a sense, what they share is the drive to narrow the perceived distance between that which is moral and that which is legal. Both reform movements on the progressive side and revanchist movements on the conservative side both say, we've got to get that which is moral and that which is legal to line up, right? If it's wrong, it should be illegal. You should go to prison for that, right? And if it's right, we should remove the laws against that. But a characteristic of liberal democracy, as I observe it, of liberal democracy with a small l, small d, is a greater tolerance for a distance, for daylight, between that which one perceives to be moral and that which is legal. In other words, in a liberal democracy, we agree that we're going to live in a society which don't see that which is moral the same way we do. And nevertheless, we have to pass laws, <laughs> right? We have to have a common life. And in a liberal democracy, there is a greater tolerance for a difference between those two things. For example, right, pornography seems to be tolerated on the basis of some sort of commitment to free speech. Rightly or wrongly, I'm just saying in a liberal democracy, that's kind of how the rules go. I would like to make it illegal right now. But fortunately for you all, I'm not in charge. Fortunately for me, actually, I'm not in charge. But I'm just drawing that as a distinction between both progressive reform movements and more conservative kind of, you know, back to the glory days movements. But what they both share, and it's one thing that I always liked, a habit of mind I like, I'm trying to train you all in, is that whenever you see a polarity, Look for the similarity. Look for the shared commitments. And in those polarities, what they both share is this idea that we need to get that which is moral and that which is legal to line up just about as straight and true as we can. 
And again, in a liberal democracy, those things get balanced, right? So, as we move into that which is moral, that which is according to God's will, which is the subject of what I'm trying to do for most of this time, what are our resources for determining that? Now, if you've been listening to me preach over this time, you've been with me, you'll know that I would not necessarily want to lean on what we might call proof texts, right? To point to a particular verse in the Bible, like Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. From the womb I knew thee. Ah, 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 there it is. It's settled. QED. End of discussion. We're moving on. Or Isaiah 49, verse 1, which is, has much the same, <laughs> the same content. Or Isaiah 44, verse 2, which says the same thing. There's now three texts. But perhaps most evocatively, let me read to you, like, kind of perhaps the most evocative proof text in around the subject of human life and when it begins, which would be Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. For it was you, I mean, this is the psalmist addressing God. For it was you, God, who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. That I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them has yet existed. All right, so that is not just a single verse, but a poetic evocation of an image that might be deployed in a discussion. We have negative evidence I would call negative evidence in the form of Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 through 25, in which someone who, if you strike a woman and that causes a premature labor in which the child dies, you're, you're on the hook for manslaughter. So there's an, that, I call that a negative evidence, and in a sense, it's not a positive effort, you know, assertion of human personhood or the value or dignity of the human person. It's more a negative evidence of if you if you destroy this, if you cause this life to end, then you'll get it. You're going to get a punishment. But it's in there. For all these texts, however, I would kind of bracket them. I would bracket them. You know that they're all in the Old Testament. Not that that's a bad thing. I'm just simply saying that's where they're all coming from. But to me, that's not the strongest as suggestive as these texts are. I mean, I will say they are suggestive. But to me, that's not decisive. The proof texts I've just read off to you are suggestive, but in my view, not decisive on their own. So what is most decisive then? And for me, again, if you've been hearing my preaching and my, what I might call my hermeneutic, which is my style or my, the fashion in which I engage a text in order to preach it, what is most decisive is the narrative of the scriptures. Scriptural narrative. That is the stories that the scripture tells. The stories that the scripture tells. Just last week during the formation time, we talked about Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9, and Abraham. And just to show you how narrative gets used theologically and how decisive it is, that the fact that Abraham is called by God to leave his home and go to the land that the Lord has promised him, and then Abraham obeys, and there's no previous biography of Abrahamic righteousness, as I said in class, unlike Noah, who is, everybody else is wicked to the very heart, but Noah's a righteous man. He's got a CV. He's got, you know, oh, okay, he's got a CV for why God is choosing him. Abraham has no such resume. He has no resume of moral qualification whatsoever, but God calls to him and commands him to 
leave and go to a promise, and he obeys. And Paul uses that narrative, and basically, and I'm, you know, this isn't like a class on Romans, but basically, the book of Genesis is like the backstory behind Paul's appropriation of Abraham rather than Moses. But Abraham has the father of faith, has the most important story for followers of Jesus to know and take in. And for Paul, the fact that, number one, here's just a basic point that Paul makes. I think this is actually in Galatians, but he also does it in Romans. The fact that Abraham came first before Moses. That's important, right? And so God has a covenant, a relationship with Abraham that is prior to the relationship and the covenant that comes on Mount Sinai through Moses. And for Paul, that means this came first and therefore it is still operative and unabrogated. And whatever comes after is like kind of something that we can talk about is conditioned. I mean, I guess a technical way would say that the Sinai covenant is conditioned by the Abrahamic covenant, right? But that the Abraham, because it came first in the story, you know? Counterfactual, maybe you know if it gone the other way, maybe you know Paul and Roman, the Epistle of the Romans might not work, but it didn't come the other way. It came that way, and so that's what I'm talking about narrative. And so when Paul talks about being called and then being sanctified, that there's this idea that God's prior unmerited choosing of the human person is the decisive fact about that person, and then. There's a response of obedience that comes after that prior choosing. That's kind of the basic, basic economy of Paul's, you know, good news. And where, it, and where he roots it in by always pointing towards Abraham and the Abrahamic story is that it's because it's the rhythm of that narrative where again and again, God calls, Abraham responds. God calls, Abraham responds. Abraham gets in a mess. God rescues him and gives him a new call and, you know, etc. And for Paul, that is definitive. That's the, in a sense, the new covenant is something that's shaped by that story. The, our experience of Jesus is shaped by how we read the experience of Abraham as he journeys towards a promise. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about narrative, a narrative theology, a narrative way to read the scriptures. And I think that for, in a sense, the Magna Carta of a narrative theology of the New Testament in, in reading it comes in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14. We read this at Christmas. It should be familiar to you. I'll start off with the first couple of verses. That, let me start off with verses 1 through 5, and then I'll jump down to verse 14. Just so you know, like, so I can, you know, you can, oh yeah, I've heard that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was Zoe, life. And the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. Jumping down to verse 14, and the word, the word that's been described in that first paragraph, the word became flesh and lived among us. Kai halagas sarx agenito, right? The word became flesh. The word became flesh. One of the claims, I mean, there are many claims being made by this very dense, rich text. But in my view, one of the claims this is making is that the word of God, God's commandments, ordinances, all the things that he has um, commanded Israel, you know, cajoled Israel to do, all of his activity with Israel, all of that history all of that narrative in which we are to walk is inscribed in the embodied narrative of Jesus received in the Gospels. That is, the word made flesh means in a sense that all those stories, all those commandments are being embodied, literally put in a body of Jesus, who is also God, and so kind of plays both sides of the story, so to speak, and this embodiment is something we're called to read like a text. 
that we, when we read the stories of Jesus, the, 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 when we read the narrative of the gospel, we are reading something that has moral meaning. When, when those gospel stories, those narratives are read coherently, that is in relationship and in unity with itself, and in depth, right? So read coherently and in depth. And in other words, what happens to, and what happens to Jesus' body as the word made flesh. What happens to Jesus' body throughout those narratives is critical and authoritative for our, the meaning of bodies themselves. So again, what happens to Jesus' body in those narratives is authoritative for understanding the meaning of the body itself. That if we want to understand what bodies are, we look to Jesus. We start there. We start there. We don't start with organic chemistry. We start with Jesus. As Christians, I'm not talking to people who are driving around tonight, but as Christians who are here, we would recognize that the word through whom all things are created, like did organic chemistry, right? So like Jesus is prior, <laughs> he is prior. His flesh is prior to science. His body is prior to science. So that's the claim I believe this text is making about how we're called to appropriate the narratives and apply them in a moral context. And, by, and what I mean by that is deciding what is right and what is wrong? Which way, which again, not to get, I don't want to get legal and right and wrong. So another way to say, in what way shall we walk? In what, how then shall we live? As a people of God. As a people of God. So, let me start with something that, again, you've pro you may have either, and I'm just going to, some things I, I have preached and kind of between the lines, and so, which some of you may have heard, and some things I maybe not have, and some things I've said, come right out and said. But in this context, I'm just going to come right out and say some of these things. So, for example, when I say that what happens to Jesus' body is authoritative in the moral realm, and this, I'm speaking, it's like, this is I, Rob, speaking now, right? <laughs> to quote the apostle, right? <laughs> to paraphrase the apostle, this is I, Rob, not the Lord. But also what I'm giving you is, this is my sustained reflection after a vocation. It's 20 years now, a vocation. A long obedience in one direction. I didn't read this out of a book. In a sense, I'm not giving you a book report. This is my view. But that... The death penalty and war itself, in particular violence, is utterly condemned by the fact of a crucified Messiah. In all the details of the Passion narrative, that when we read the Passion narrative, I read that has an utter categorical and absolute condemnation of all violence. The death penalty in particular has something which was justly, legally applied to Jesus. Jesus was convicted of the crime of leading the people astray. Right? Do we need to hear any more? Right? We've heard it from his own lips. He was legally convicted. Which if that doesn't divorce the category of legality and morality in your mind, I don't know what will. Right? It's not like it's not like there was this miscarriage of justice. Oh, no, he was correctly put to death. If what he was saying was false, right? I mean that's the tragedy. I mean that's which the gospels are has great narratives. The gospels are trying to bring out the pathos and the tragedy of the fact that he's actually telling the truth. So this is actually a horrible mistake, horrible error, right? But that. The passion heirs themselves condemn the death penalty as a legal outcome for God's people. In a sense, and I've had a conversation with one of you about this, and again, there are many people who there's a just war tradition and I stand outside of it. 
I fundamentally disagree with the just war tradition. Many Christians of good faith live with inside that tradition. And I find them challenging and blessed conversation partners. But I stand outside of the just war tradition in that I think those terms are oxymoronic. One can think of, of conditions in which in a fallen world, war is an outcome which must be reckoned with, but in no sense is that just in the sense of like, I am justified by Christ. You know, in no sense, it may be legal, it may be explainable, <laughs> excusable from a human point of view, but in no way can it be described as a moral measure. Onward, Christian soldiers. Oh my goodness. Only, you know, but you, and it could be a usable hymn, but you can't sing it on the deck of a battleship. Right? If you've seen the black and white footage. So for me, just war is not something that's possible within a Christian discourse. It's possible within a secular discourse. I mean, secular authorities can talk about justice from their point of view but that will always be a net zero game, in my view. Other examples from the passion narrative, just to flesh out what I'm talking about here, other examples would be the offer of the disciples in the Gospel of Luke's passion narrative to bring swords. Oh, look, here are two swords, and Jesus kind of like, basta. It was kind of like, enough already. You know, you guys aren't listening, right? I'm speaking metaphorically here, guys. You know, like, don't. Like, don't take me literally. I'm not like, oh, look, here's some swords. Let's bring those. And if you think that it, it, it's like violence, it's like how can you read the Gospel of John and see Jesus heal Malchus's ear after it's been cut off by Peter and Jesus saying, enough of this, and heals the ear. As, a, as anything less than a categorical statement in flesh. Jesus didn't say, now what I'm trying to explain to you people is that the violence is not a good thing. No, he embodies it. And he pays the cost in suffering love. I'm not saying that saying no to violence is easy, right? You know, I'm saying that it causes suffering. It is the path of the cross. Just war, you don't need a cross to wage a just war. You know, but if you're willing to suffer for the truth, then you do need a resurrection to vindicate you. At least, otherwise it just doesn't make sense. Otherwise you're just a fool. Which again, that's, you know, 1 Corinthians 15. John chapter 8. The woman caught in adultery. Legal. Legal. Jesus intervenes. The temptations. Take all this worldly power. Go ahead and use it for the cause of good. I'm sure, Jesus, you're a good person, and you'll use this power in the right way. Get behind me, right? John chapter 6 and the parallels, but especially John chapter 6, where after the feeding of 5,000, Jesus refuses to be made king by force. And that's, it's right there in the air. They were going to make him king by force. So that, in a sense, ostensibly, they could use force to establish a kingdom. And Jesus, like I, I like to say, is somewhat flip, but he does his Jedi thing, and he just he disappears. Like they can't get their hands on him; he escapes, etc., etc., etc. You know, I could just keep going through. I mean, the passion predictions. I mean, the Son of Man must suffer. I mean, all this stuff, right? So that's what I'm talking about in terms of how I read a narrative in the Gospels, and I'm reading a moral imperative, it's, in a, it's not just a story, it's binding, right? and the details of that story matter. It's not just like, well, this happened, and then Jesus was on the cross, and our sins were forgiven, then Easter Sunday, ta-da! But the Gospels give us these details for a reason. A reason that they're there. Okay. So, one of the key issues at stake in abortion, and but let me see, just by abortion, what I'm talking about is what people popular mean and what they're talking about in the popular discourse. And 
I'm talking about it as a medical term. But one of the key issues at stake in abortion is the meaning of human life. And is a gestating fetus included in the semantic field of that term? That's a, that's a key issue. One might say it's like the issue. And what does the term human life itself mean anyway? So I will take it, the case to its, in rhetorical terms, is called taking it to its perfection. That is, I'll take it to its extreme limit. The embryo. The fertilized embryo. Okay? Starting to chugga 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 chugga. Okay. Is it human? It's not dog. If you cut off the mole on my neck, you would have to say that tissue, if you're a scientist, you would say that tissue is human tissue. It's not dog tissue, it's not cat tissue, it's not earthworm tissue, it's human tissue. So is the embryo human? Of course it must be. Yes, it is. It is human. It's not tree. It's not shrub. It's not newt. It is human. Is it life? Well, I think the whole problem we're addressing is that if this chugga 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 keeps going, it will grow, all things consider, all things eat, being even, into one of us. <laughs> so, cells are dividing and replicating, cells are differentiating, that's life. <laughs> you know, so, yes, it is human, and it is life. But I mean, I just, I mean, I don't see how you can define those terms in any other way. Although I'll give you a chance at the end, if you wish. But we all sense, we all sense that there is more to the term than that, isn't there? That's not what we're talking about. Although we should start there with the denotation of those terms. There is more to the term than that. Is the embryo, I think what we mean when we ask that question is, is the embryo and the following developmental stages a person? person. And by person, I mean a someone, not a something. A someone included in the human family. Not an object, but a subject. It's a critical difference. Is this human life that we're talking about an object, a thing, this, like, throw across the room, it's like it's a thing. Or is it a subject? Capable of receiving love. Capable of receiving, and I double underscore, receiving love. Not necessarily giving love, but is, a, is the human life capable of receiving love? In particular, a subject of God's love, being followers of Jesus in this room, of God's love, which is actually, and we don't have time, and, and I, you know, there's a friend of ours in this room who could do a better, much better job than I could of this, but which is actually the radical foundation of what it means to be a person, that is to be a recipient of God's love. That, in a sense, God's love is the Magna Carta of the human person. All, and it's, it really is, it defines the meaning of person all the way from Trinitarian theology of the life of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit shared together as a union of love all the way to, from Trinity to anthropology of the, of the human person, of, this, of the, what is a human person, of a Christian anthropology. On the human side, personhood inheres solely in the capacity to receive divine love. I would point to texts like 1 John chapter 4. We do not love because God loved us. Right? Or we, do, we Basically, we love, we love um, because God loved us. Basically, is God's love is prior. Is God's love is the prior reality to all human love and existence, all human being. And Galatians chapter 2, where Paul will talk about how while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, 
while I was a sinner, Christ died. You know, he died for my trespasses. So being a recipient of God's love is what it means to be a person from the human side. Out of this receptivity to divine love flows a reflectivity. A reflectivity that we can we all are defined by our capability of receiving God's love, but then there's a reflectivity of that love out to others. Another way to put it is, in a sense, we radiate God's love not because we are the sun, but because we are the moon. Right? We receive it and then reflect it. It can be very bright in the dark. Don't underestimate the light of the human moon of love. From receptivity flows reflectivity, suggested, embodied, and articulated so movingly by Jean Vanier in his writings about the large community and how even catastrophically handicapped persons are capable of receiving love and miraculously reflect that love back. Not in ways in which able normed, you know, kind of folks would consider it, but he gives such an eloquent witness to how even the profoundly disabled can reflect the love that they've received from God. Receptivity leads to reflectivity, leads to personhood, or it is the, is the evidence of personhood, not cognition. Not production. Those are not the defining marks of a person. Cognition and production, making things of value to other people, is not what personhood is about, in my view. So what aspect, what aspect of the scriptural narrative, what part of the story speaks to the personhood of the embryonic human life? And... You've probably already thought of it, and when I say it, you say, well, of course. It's Luke chapters 1 and 2, right? Especially chapter 1, verses 26 through 38, which I'll read to you. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. It's receptivity. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greetings this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. We don't have a resume about Mary. The tradition does, but Luke has structured this narrative to reflect Abraham. Right? It's out of the blue. I'm going to pick you. You're going to go on a journey. I mean, this is, Luke has it all. It's all in his head. It's all right here. That's a beautiful thing. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found fear with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, much like Abraham before the destruction of Sodom, I have a question. How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who is said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said very Abrahamically, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. So it could be at the Oaks of Mamre. It could be, you know, all kinds of places, right? So, you will conceive. Already the Holy Spirit overshadows. Already the action of God is in play. And name him Jesus. Naming Naming. Not a things don't get names. People get names. 
Although we crazily sometimes name our pets and cars people, people name. But, but don't let that fool you. That's a silly modern habit. People get names. People get names. And the name is God saves. God saves. So with the name comes a vocation. A calling to receive and reflect God's love. Even Matthew's account of Joseph is supportive of this account where basically there's, you know, the, the, what is going on in Mary despite the problematic and questionable and suspicious nature of the pregnancy is nevertheless the work of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not even, you know, then you got the visitation that comes before that. It's a kind of a prelude. But we're going to talk about Jesus. <laughs> because we're not baptized into John the Baptist, we are baptized into union with Jesus, Messiah. There is no greater signification of personhood than naming. And with this name, God saves, shared with us retroactively from our baptism to our conception, and not ours only, but to but those of the whole world. That in the conception of Jesus and his naming by the God through the power of the Holy Spirit, it's a signification that all, all those conceived are destined to receive and reflect the love of God. All have a vocation. All have a vocation. Bef that is prior to cognition or to production. Just because of who they are, as God has made them to be. It's their created nature. And so the embryonic child, all the way through the stage of development, is named as a creature of God who bears his love into the world. So we all, as human beings, share in that destiny and identity. That is to say, from conception, what this narrative, in my view, demonstrates is that every human life is personed, made a subject of God's steadfast chesed, right? His, you know, we went on about that for a long time. God's chesed, his steadfast saving love and given a vocation even if the rest of humanity doesn't see it, right? It's a kind of a secret. Mary kind of holds this as a secret. Even if it is merely to be the recipient of love, even if that's the only thing you're supposed to do, that's enough. It is enough to be a recipient of divine love. You don't need anything else on your CV. That's, that's by the way, the good news. That's called grace, right? And it is so alien to the thinking of this world with this insistence on productivity as a measurement of worth. A world shaped by perhaps one of the least fortunate things that Pascal said, which I, you know, go, 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 ergo sum, right? I think, therefore I am. In my view, I am loved by God, therefore I am. That's, to me, the scriptural witness. I am loved by God, therefore I am. I exist as the apple of his eye. His gaze is upon me, right? That gives me existence. And again, as the first letter of John suggests, right, is it first, second? I can't remember, I'm an angry. But when he says, we shall see him as he is, right? That when, and then when we, See, that, that we are transformed even further by even just looking at God's love for us. And a fundamental element of the gospel itself, the good news of the victory of God's love in Jesus is that this divine love does not depend in any way on human concurrence. Let me say that again. The fundamental element of the gospel itself, the good news of the victory of God's love in Jesus is that this divine love does not depend in any way on human concurrence. In other words, 
God loves you. And every human person, born and unborn, whether or not anyone else does, including your parents. Think for a moment if this were not the case. Just let's puzzle on that for a little bit. Think for a moment if this were not the case. If our worth, our divine worth, our ability to receive God's word, which is, you know, the divine worth is really the only one that matters, was dependent on any other human being loving us. Right? God so loved you because, well, somebody else loved you and God said, okay, well, I'll second the motion. That's, that's not good news. <laughs> that's not the gospel. So think about that. Human beings don't have to agree that someone is loved by God. They are. Period. End of sentence. We don't need a majority of the people in our culture to love us, let alone a supermajority needed for a constitutional amendment. We don't need that many people to love us for God to love us. God loves us. Even if the other side, even if all the human beings on the ledger are zero, it doesn't matter. God loves us. That's, that's the good news. That's very freeing, by the way. It actually means you can be yourself. <laughs> in, instead of like, I better get up to my quota of people loving me, otherwise, you know, like, uh, it ceases to be. And isn't that, by the way, one of the great tragedies and sufferings of, say, depression? Suicidal ideation, the idea that the side of the ledger is zero and there's no divine love either. So this is a really important thing. This is a really important first principle. God's love being one equals infinity in, in terms of who we need to love us. So no, the embryo is a person, beloved of God, Despite any circumstance surrounding conception, a person is a person is a person. The most loathsome murderer is a person. Vladimir Putin is a person. They may be misshapen persons, but they are persons. They may be persons in need of healing and God's mercy, but they are persons. Confederate soldiers were persons as well as the three-fifths legal persons whose slavery they were seeking to sustain, all were persons. An unborn child conceived through a crime is a person, beloved of God. This was in fact enshrined in some ways in the life of our Jewish brothers and sisters by the, if you have a Jewish mother, you are a Jew rule coming about in the realities of life amidst pogrom and systematic rape, the community decided that if your mother was Jewish, because we don't know when our village was burned down, what happened, or actually we do know. And as far as we're all concerned, you're a Jew, because your mother was. And we're not gonna worry about how you came to be in your mother. That, that ethic, that commitment to the agnosticism about the identity of the father, given the certitude of the identity of the mother, is something that comes from suffering and persecution. It's a response to it. St. Matthew's genealogy, as well as, the clearly as well as the clearly described problematic nature of Mary's pregnancy in that gospel and the challenge it posed to Joseph, the gospel it doesn't pull any punches, it posed a real problem to Joseph. In other words, the scriptural narrative itself speaks to the call of faith, which is beatific in the extreme demand it places on the human person's place in human, in positions of moral responsibility. That is, Joseph was asked a really big thing. Even though he's a righteous man, he was asked a really big thing. But God asked it, and he obeyed. That's, that's the narratives that we inherit as our moral kind of guideposts. And it's no, there's no denying the fact that, the, that in a sense, 
the Beatitudes and the, be the Beatitudinal vision of the human person presented to us in Matthew's Gospel, chapters 5 through 8, are, is really hard. <laughs> you know, forgiving people, praying for your enemies, blessing those, it's really hard, but God asks us to do it. God is in the business of asking hard things. So, in a sense, basically, we, this is all in a kind of a, a, a whole constellation of difficult asks from God to humanity, to those who would follow and walk in his ways. Now, note, before I go on, that I have not articulated at this point any particular pastoral, let alone legal, program. As I like to say, knowing the right answer is the beginning of a conversation, not the end of it. But there is more to be said in relation to violence, which is an assault on the wholeness of human persons, emotional, physical, etc. As I said before and preached repeatedly, all violence is utterly condemned by the assault on the body and soul of Jesus Messiah. As was the crucifixion, state-administered torture with its scientific assault on the human person is an abomination. In Pinochet's Chile, they had people with MD after their name administering torture so that it was particularly effective, so that people stayed alive. They studied ways in which people could be horrible, placed in horrible pain without marks left on their body. They, these MDs did this. Right? The fact that violence is administered by people in white coats with MD after their name does not morally sanitize it any more than getting shot is better because soldiers in a firing squad did it. Oh, they're professionals. It's much better to be shot by them than, I mean, like some you know, thug on the street. I mean, that's, I mean, that's getting shot. But as long as soldiers that the state has approved who are marksmen, as, if they do it, oh, well, then that's better. If anything, it makes it more horrible. I would specifically include both state-sponsored, medically performed lethal injections, MDs are supervising all that stuff, and state-certified abortion procedures has examples of medical violence condemned by the cross with a spectrum, with a spectrum that ranges from the regrettable and tragic pharmaceutical abortion, i.e. Plan B, to which, in which the violent expulsion of the embryo from the womb leads to the end of the pregnancy to the utterly demonic late-term partial birth abortion, which represents about 1%, evidently, of abortions that are performed. What of ectopic pregnancies, etc., etc.? That's been an issue that's come about. Therapeutic medicine does indeed often use actions which in some circumstances would be violent, Cutting, poking. To heal a body already assaulted by the violent brokenness of disease or trauma. You break a bone, that's an assault already. So sometimes the dog's going to have to you know, yank it and cause more pain in order to fix the wound. We know that therapeutic medicine does this. I would submit that an active, well formed moral intelligence can discern a difference between these two things. Between a post-mastectomy breast reconstruction or a cosmetic breast augmentation. A, 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 a form of moral intelligence can determine a difference between those two things. Both plastic surgeons, both MDs, both using mesh of the same material. I would evaluate those two things differently. Cleft palates versus nose jobs, right? There's cutting, there's bone, it's like, but I think a moral intelligence could probably discern that there's a difference between those two things. And I think I have quipped from the pulpit, you're gonna get that nose back anyway in the resurrection, so don't bother fixing it. <laughs> like, you're gonna be, it's gonna be with you from eternity. You're gonna lose it and you're gonna gain it back in the end. So, live with yourself. God loves you. That's what I've been trying to say. <laughs> This also has ramifications for discussions around treatments of gender dysphoria, which is a rabbit trail I won't even get into. 
However, you can apply these principles of violence and a spectrum of violence yourselves. In my judgment, this would apply to life of the mother cases before viability if it is medically determined that the mother would literally perish and therefore the chance of the baby being born would be lost within a medical realm of certainty, then, okay, and nothing's 100%, but in the doctor's best judgment, I could see an allowance for that. Therefore, given the absolute value of the human person rooted in God's love, beginning with conception, and the total commitment of that divine love to the wholeness and dignity of the human person against any and all forms of violence, I believe that abortion is at any stage of pregnancy in any circumstance contrary to the will of God, except for the circumstances I've just mentioned, with the moral culpability and spiritual consequences of that rebellion against God's will increasing exponentially as the child's development proceeds towards delivery and especially past viability. And this conclusion, the personhood of the unborn child, is decisive for the rest of the debate. If once one decides this is a human person and violence can't be committed against it, that shapes a lot of other stuff. So now what? Note again that I have not actually articulated or endorsed any particular state-based state responses, regulations, or remedies. I'll suggest what I see as a way forward at the end. But first, let me address some common objections, I, uh, aka talking points, I've seen on TV coverage and social media. Number one. These are like my, this is like my greatest hits list. The Bible doesn't mention abortion. This is true in a literal sense, although I would put an asterisk at Numbers chapter five if you wanna be interested in that. It's a very ancient text, it's really funky. But uh, if you wanna look it up, you can on your own time. But it's also true about a number of things that, I mean, the Bible doesn't say this, or doesn't mention this. Well, that's also true about automatic weapons, tax policies, environmental pollution. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that the Bible doesn't specifically talk about. We have to, from the narrative, figure it out. <laughs> so I hope that I've shown that while a positivistic case cannot be made for a prohibition against abortion, a convincing case can be made for dignity and valuation. Secondly, the part of the other thing about this particular point is that, and frankly, it's typically not made in good faith. That is, the people who typically say this, if I were to show them that something is prohibited by the Bible, would that, oh, well, that settles it. No, of course not. This only comes from progressive or secular directions. This is, it's not in good faith, right? If I was, oh, well, the Bible actually does prohibit this. Oh, I mean, they'd be like, well, oh, oh, oh. it's like, no, you don't really mean it. And yes, it may not be in the Bible, but the earliest Christians thought it clearly implicit in the Jesus they knew and worshiped because we find specific prohibitions against abortion in the earliest post-biblical, post-New Testament texts like the DDK, the letter of Barnabas, which mention abortion specifically. So clearly the first generations of Christians thought this was a no-brainer. Second point, that I, second talking point. Keep your religion out of politics. <laughs> the non-personhood of the unborn, the non-personhood of the unborn is also a religious conviction. I can't prove to you that that child is ensouled or a person, but you can't disprove it to me either. It's a religious conviction. Welcome to post-modernity, people. There's no neutral ground. There is no neutral ground. To say that an embryo is not a person is a religious conviction. It's just, it's simply at odds with Christianity, but it is a religious conviction. There is no neutral ground on which someone can stand objectively to be, oh, you, you religious people, you're, you're not objective. We are objective because we see things through the lens of something called science. She blinded me. Anyway, so through science, I can't, I can't help it, but it's, I think of that song. It is not science, right? Science is a euphemism for atheistic materialism, which unhappily is the working theology of many Christians when they go to do things that matter to them. Secondly, this is still a liberal democracy as far as I know. My religious motivations 
are a protected and accepted part of my participation and judgments within the public order. If you want to tell me to get my religion, well, go tell a Muslim that. How does that feel? Go tell your Muslim friends or Jewish friends. Keep your religion out of politics. I, you know, I don't know. As far as I know, this, this is still a liberal democracy. This is actually what the First Amendment protects. It is a fundamental part of Christian engagement for the public good and something Christians cannot in any circumstance surrender. Just ask the black church. You want to go ask the black church to keep their religion out of politics? You can try it. See what they say. How about Catholic Charities, who responded to the enormous immigration crisis where we had thousands of young men come to our city and Catholic Charities was the only group big enough and with the human power enough to do something about it. Should they have kept their religion out of politics? Well, they sure come in handy sometimes, don't they? These Christians, you know, with their shelters and whatnot. I am a follower of Jesus and I vote, should strike terror into the heart of Planned Parenthood, the NRA, and the Proud Boys all together. Are you ready to say, and I said, you know, tax the church, I've seen that. Do you reserve the scorn only for Christians? Right? Tax the synagogue? You ready? Say that to your friends. Oh yeah, I'm ready to tax the mosque. Again, if you only think that about Christians, can that fit within a commitment to a liberal democratic order? It isn't like picking on a particular group. Anyway, I don't know. I'm not a constitutional scholar. Third, okay, if you're pro-life, that's fine to be one personally. That's fine. Just don't get an abortion yourself. Ironically, this was a factor in younger Americans skewing pro-life before 2016. Actually, there was great hope for us who walk in the ways that I do because actually younger people were starting to skew more towards pro-life before 2016 and it got caught up in the maelstrom. He says, my view was winning. Because, why? Because people who are pro-life had children and raised them. And so demographically things were moving over a course of 40 years, 50 years, things were starting to move. The people who valued children had them, who, funnily enough, valued their own children. But let's perfect this logic, as I like to say, and apply it to other issues that progressives tend to cherish. This is a progressive talking point. Okay, fine. If you don't like AR-15s, just don't buy one. But don't, don't come try to take mine. I mean, if you don't like them, I mean, I understand, but, you know, just don't. It's a personal choice. Your choice of weapon should be between you and your gunsmith, okay? Don't buy a weapon you can't handle. It should be between specialists. If you don't like slavery, just don't buy a slave, right? That was called 1850, right? That was, that was called the Kansas-Nebraska Act. I mean, that was where that led us to 1860. You're like, oh yeah, okay, if you don't like slaves, just don't have them in your state, but we're gonna have them in our state and we'll somehow learn to live this way. It is precisely a commitment to the common good, especially this highest good of the value and dignity of human life that compels engagement with this issue. Here's another one. If you're not a woman, you don't get an opinion. So it's not a between a, a woman and her physician then, unless I guess the physician is a woman. Then I guess it would, then they can have opinions. But I do not accept the medical establishment's privileged engagement in this issue. The logic of this position falls apart as soon as you walk into other areas of moral deliberation. Well, you can have an opinion on the death penalty if someone in your family was killed, right? If not, you just sit down and shut up. We'll let the victims' families decide about this, okay? We're gonna let victims' families decide how, how much time people spend in prison. Does that sound good to you? We don't follow this moral logic. We don't, but it gets thrown up in this particular area for some reason. It's about, this is probably more serious. This is, a, it's about bodily autonomy. Has this, it's like bodily autonomy, that settles it. It's like the trump card. Okay, well that's all very good, but bodily autonomy. Oh, well, I guess I have nothing else to say. 
it depends, this notion depends upon a peculiarly modern, quite therapeutic notion of the self. And the self has an emotional self-actualizing agent that sits above the body, right? Has kind of has an alien consciousness, and then which the self uses the body as a tool in his quest for realization. So my body is something that I will use in order to build my self. That's bodily autonomy. Don't tell me what to do. I'm autonomous. I'm, I'm the self. First of all, I say a self is not a person in the Christian sense. It defies a Christian anthropology. The self has a body, soul, spirit unity. That is, we're not souls that kind of like operate robot bodies. You know, that's not how we view, we're a body-soul unity. It is the fruit of the poisonous tree of property rights, which Karl Marx correctly diagnosed as the root of modern systems of oppression. That is to say, keep your laws off my body came from keep your laws off my factory. The factory came first <laughs> in the discussion. The baronial estate came first. Keep your laws, king, off my baronial estate. It's mine. I can do what I want with my serfs and with my river. I can damn it if I want, and no one else can say anything about it. That's, that's property rights, and human rights flow from that. They came later. I studied the period in history when it happened, okay? It's, it's like the Enlightenment. For Christians, bodily autonomy is not a thing. I'm sorry to tell you, you are not your own. You are bought with a price. Your citizenship is in a kingdom in which you are transferred by your baptism. Your body and soul belong not to you, but to Jesus Messiah, who will raise them both from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. Another way of saying this is that our notion of the body must be conditioned by the resurrection, not by our notion of ourself. The resurrection defines the meaning of the body. Finally, if you were really pro-life, then you would support fill in the blank. Now, this would be a telling point if I were a Republican politician. <laughs> and sadly, if I was a white evangelical, unhappily. But it's not a telling point against me. <laughs> because I will see you and raise you not slaughtering unborn children. I'm like, I'll, so whatever you throw at me, I'll say, absolutely, let's do that. And not kill unborn children. So yes, maternal health care, and not killing children. You know, yes, dignity for immigrants, and not killing their children. So, you know, whatever you put at me, I'm just going to raise you not killing children. So, you know, have at it. I'm, I'm all for it. Whatever it is, I'll vote for it. You bet. Now, at last, I'm willing to make several political observations. Though, again, I want you, I mean, it's taken me, what? An hour and 50 minutes, just, I, I'm trying to lay out this case because I'm, uh, I want you to note my order of operations. For those of you with engineering kind of brains, right? My order of operations. I have not started out with a political commitment, which I then seek to theologically underwrite. I've started with scriptural reflection that is consistent with what I undertake, with what I preach and undertake to understand in season and out of season. In other words, I, what I'm saying has your priest says, I think this is consistent with what you've heard me say and preach in the style in which I've engaged just the gospel of life in general. And then tentatively, tentatively seek to find out how it cashes out in a range of particular political options. So I will end where I began with a CBS poll the same CBS poll, but then they went on to ask the question a little bit differently. Let me do that. So, I found, I found absolutely fascinating because they asked the question in a, the same people, same group of people, but they asked the question in a, in a slightly different way. They asked the question, at what point in pregnancy should abortion be legal in your state? At what point in pregnancy, in the development? So 12% said illegal in all cases, right? You're not going to budge these folks. 
they're the same 12% who answered on the, on the extreme in the first question. Like, they are not budging, they don't, it's like, they're absolutely consistent. 23% said within the first month. But see, a lot of what gets the reporting on this, on you know, in the new, in the in the media, is like, ah, look, it's only a few people who, you know, who are again, you know, who are in favor of Roe v. Wade because the understanding of Roe v. Wade is so mistaken um, in, in out there because of the news. But you have twenty three percent who are willing to say in the first month, yes, but after no, that's like eight months, <laughs> you know, like whoa, it goes on. 33% within first trimester. Ooh. How many how many weeks is three months again? Uh, 12 to 13. When did the Mississippi law cut it off? 15 weeks. So how many what percentage of people would be in favor of that? Is that an extreme position? Uh, is 60% of the populace extreme? I don't, I mean, I'm just saying like, that, I mean, if you really look at how this breaks out, what's actually at stake in Dobbs and in the Mississippi case, by the way, in France, who's, you know, good old Macron uh, went after us, it's at 14 weeks except for the life of the mother, and they, and they interpret that rule much more strictly than we do in the United States. Like, it actually has to be like the life of the mother. 15% <clears throat> within second trimester. So remember, we have, or earlier, we had 33% responded at the, in the first question, 33% were saying abortion should be legal in all cases, but then when asked this question, only 17% said that abortion should be legal at any point in a pregnancy all the way up to delivery. So you tell me what's extreme. I mean, I'm just, I'm just trying to objectively, you know, I mean, yes. Absolutely. 12% would be kind of on the far end of, of politics. As someone who's against the death penalty, a pacifist, pro-life, I, I get it. I'm in a minority. I get it. <laughs> like, so I'm not here to impose my views on anybody because I understand and I have the humility to understand that they're strange. But I would say this is extreme as well, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, if, you, if you count, like in political life, the ends being extremes to the left or to the right, this is an extreme position. Although this, was the, this position was the basis of Senator Schumer's bill that was to codify Roe. This is what they mean right now. Now, hopefully the discussion might change. What I'm seeing, <laughs> what I'm seeing is a consensus. But the problem is, historically speaking, in American politics, which is, you know, kind of winner take all, and is nobody is willing to settle for the half loaf. You know, and so the, pe the problem up here is people up here have been very inflexible, very judgmental, very coercive, unwilling to compromise. That in a sense that any compromise is that their person responsible for the death of the infants. It's like, let's, let's talk. Let, can we say, how about here? By the way, 5% of abortions happen after 15 weeks. So, you know, that is, so we're only talking here, we're only talking about the, the 5%. 5% 5 is better than, I mean, I've got to say, like, you know, for, from my, where I sit, you, you don't have to agree with me, but where I'm sitting, 5%, you know, 95% is better than 100%. Now, let's let's get some consensus. I'm not in the extreme as a matter of public policy. Again, as I said, I think it's just so, ooh, you know. Although everything I said was supported, I deeply sympathize with it, and I view it as the ultimate aim of an authentic Christian effort to reform on this issue. In other words, I cop to the fact that I'd like to see less daylight <laughs> between what is right and what is legal on this issue. However, 
I live in a society as a follower of Jesus. Which means that not only would abortion be, or it's basically on the one hand, it means that I believe that abortion, not only should abortion be illegal, we should have a culture in which it is morally unthinkable. And this, in a sense, part of the whole discussion about these individual cases, right? Individual cases, where I think the Christian mission should be to create a culture in which abortion has a choice is unthinkable, morally speaking. I mean, not unthinkable, scientifically speaking, you know, medically speaking, morally speaking, unthinkable. Has unthinkable, has child abuse, has an option. Like, well, you know, could you imagine going to a therapist? Well, you know, you could just beat the kid within, you know, just within an inch of his life. I mean, that would be morally unthinkable. We're, they're not supposed to say that. I'm saying that's the way abortion should be. In, in, a, in, a, my, in a perfect world, which we will never attain. That's morally unthinkable as burning crosses on lawns. Now, people do it, but not in polite society. Right? Not in people who would, you know, you'd want to have dinner with them. Unthinkable in a community-wide way. This is not impossible. This is not impossible. Let me give you an example. In 1981, the movie Arthur was released. If you remember the movie Arthur with Dudley Moore, who basically stumbles around drunk. I mean, that's the whole movie. The whole movie is just about this rich guy who stumbles around drunk and his butler who kind of toodles after him. I mean, and to poor Eliza Minnelli, who must have been triggered through that whole filming. I mean, like, oh my God, adult child of an alcoholic in this movie with, like, where she's falling in love with an alcoholic. But, you know, so... There's Arthur in 1981. That was funny. It was funny. It was a big movie. But you know what happened in 1980? An organization called Mothers Against Drunk Driving was founded in California. And within a decade, that was not funny anymore. And Arthur II was about Arthur sobering. He got sober. He was sobered up. He struggled. He fell off the wagon. But being a drunk who drives around and crashes into things wasn't funny anymore. Because a, a social reform organization said drinking and driving has consequences. This sort of behavior has societal consequences. It's a tragedy. It's killing our children. And the society changed. Another example I'd give you is like basically giving a broad a slap. If you watch the movies from the 1950s, like a Frank Sinatra movie from the 1950s, that was, that was, I mean, that was on just film. And it was nothing. I mean, that was perceived to be normal. It's like you come home, you get your man, you know, she's making you your Manhattan, and if it's not right, you give the broad a slap. It's good for her. Domestic violence is no longer morally thinkable. You know, now of course, I, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm just saying that, and that's what I would love to see happen for abortion. It's where it was totally normal and nobody thought anything of it. Well, I mean, let's not take it to extremes, of course. Right? Don't put a mark on her. But in the course of time, that cultural norm changed towards what I would consider a, a gospel value of the dignity of all people. Right? So that's what I would hope for. With the Dobbs decision, however, and our current political climate, I think we're in a situation more like prohibition. Now, there are real reasons for that reform. I'm a historian. I was like, it's like, you know, men were drunk. They're spending all their wages. They they're, couldn't feed their families. They're going home and beating their wives, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there were also ethnic and class overtones, which in the end killed it. Because it was, perceived, it was put into place and perceived to be an effort on the part of WASPs to keep those mixed Pollocks and Dagos from drinking too much and ruining our cities. They should be working at their jobs and not unionizing. You know, those unions tend to form in those bars and saloons. We need to put a stop to that. So there were ethnic and class overtones in the prohibition movement. Um, and, all the, and by the way, there are class overtones in that, of course, the wealthy all had their, their booze. <laughs> they all have their booze. And there's this sense in which the wealthy will get whatever they want anyway. But the implementation of prohibition caused a reaction that, if anything, made it worse. When it's the movie Arthur, right? We went from Carrie Nation to Arthur. 
I have preached and taught that liberal democracy, for its weaknesses, does have the gospel virtues of a dependence on persuasion and prohibition of violence as political means. However, a political outcome perceived as coercive is a form of social violence, in my view. That is, if it's perceived that these folks put something on all the of these folks, that is a form of social violence. Recall the persuasion, expanding the, you know, kind of trying to bump those numbers up, right? And I believe that Christians are called to engage in social change and seek moral consensus where, consensus where it can be found. And then go on to do the hard work of moral persuasion and, or even culture making. What John Paul II called the culture of life, which must start in the church, where judgment will begin as well. Fini.